Good morning. All right, great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're um, just about to start. Uh, so welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. This is a very special Medical Grand Rounds in honor of our own Dr. Bill Bussey, um, a lectureship in his honor. Um, and to do the introductions, I will hand the podium, the virtual podium over to Dr. Nizar Jarjor. Thank you very, very much, Lynn. Uh, if I may have the next slide. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you very, very much for uh, joining us. Uh, th this morning, uh, we are uh, celebrating uh, Dr. William uh, Bussey with a visiting professorship in his honor. Uh, many of you not know Dr. Bussey, uh, obviously, for his many years of service. Uh, but you might not know that uh, Bill Bussey is really a, a badger through and through. He went to the University of Wisconsin as an undergrad, a medical resident, medical student, and his fellowship, completing that in 1973. After that, he remained in the faculty as an assistant uh, professor, 73 through 78, associate, 78 to 84, and a professor of medicines uh, from 1984 to present day. He was uh, the allergy section chief from 78 to 2004 and the Department, Department of Medicine chair 2005 to 2009. Uh, Dr. Bussey is a world renowned allergist. And uh, to say that he has done every leadership role in allergy field is really an understatement. You know, he has been the chair of the American Board of Allergy Immunology, the president of uh, the Academy of uh, American Academy of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. He has uh, basically chaired any important committee uh, that had to deal with allergy and asthma uh, for several decades. Um, the most important one probably is the uh, United States uh, Asthma Guidelines sponsored by the NIH, which he chaired from 2003 to 2004 and was a, has been a part of it since its inception. Uh, in 2014, the American Thoracic Society uh, bestowed upon him uh, the Breathing for Life Award. This is a very special award given to one member of the society per year, a society that has 15,000 uh, members. Dr. Bassi received the largest NIH award in the history of the University of Wisconsin, which is the inner city asthma, the, the ICAC, and uh, the most recent renewal that he uh, led in 2014 to 2021 was uh, worth $70 million. Um, again, you will hear some of the uh, work uh, of Dr. Bassi in the presentation we were going to have uh, this morning, but his impact will be certainly felt for many years to come. Uh, this morning, it's my great privilege and honor to uh, present the uh, William Bussey uh, Visiting Professor of Medicine for 2021, Dr. Praveen Akosara, who is a, a Associate Professor of Medicine uh, in the Division of uh, Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Dr. Akosara is a, a is, uh, has earned his uh, undergraduate degree from Harvard uh, University in 1997. And in 2002, uh, his MD degree from Case Western University uh, in uh, Ohio. He returned to Boston uh, for medicine residency and a pulmonary critical care fellowship at Beth Israel and the Harvard combined uh, program, followed by a postdoctoral uh, research allergy fellowship uh, at Harvard that he and, and uh, Beth Israel that he completed in 2009. He remained on the faculty at Harvard until 2015, at which point he moved to UC San Diego, where he is currently uh, the lead uh, uh, investigator for the Center of Excellence uh, for Asthma and Sinus uh, Disease. Uh, Praveen's research efforts uh, have uh, extended from basic investiga investigation of eosinophil biology to clinical and translational studies of asthma and allergic diseases. He is the principal investigator of the UC San Diego's uh, Clinical Center for NHLBI Precise Network, which is examining the precision intervention in severe asthma. We are fortunate to be partners with Praveen and his colleagues in this NIH-funded network. Uh, Dr. Akosata is also a co-investigator in a pivotal study that showed the efficacy of anti-IL-5 therapy and EGPA. Uh, 
his basic science research has focused on studies of uh, basic uh, human uh, cell, uh, eosinophil cell biology and traffic and as well as activation and release of content. Praveen received a faculty teaching award from UC San Diego uh, resident in 2017, 2018, and 2020. He is a wonderful, wonderful teacher that who is very valued by, by the resident. In addition, he has received a certificate of special congressional uh, acknowledgement from the US House of Representatives uh, uh, because of his work on asthma. He has written extensively in immunosinophil biology and uh, in clinical consideration in asthma and allergic diseases, uh, particularly the role of eosinophil. He is a member at large of the board of director of the International Eosinophil Society. And today we are fortunate to have him speak to us on the role of eosinophil in allergic disease. Welcome, uh, Praveen. Thank you, Dr. Jarjour. Um, sounds a lot better when you say my uh, my CV than when I when I say it. So that uh, it's much much appreciated. It's a uh, really a honor to to be here. Um, I'll I'll start by by saying you know as I've uh, gone through my my career to, to this point, I, I always go to the meetings, either the ESNFL meetings or the allergy meetings, and. Um, always have seen folks from Wisconsin from the Bussy lineage who've, uh, who've showed this picture of this, uh, this eosinophil uh, sculpture that uh, for a long time was outside of Dr. Bussy's house and now, uh, now lives in the, in the medical school. I was hoping to visit it if I was uh, there in person and, uh, and take a picture next to it, maybe, uh, maybe next time. But uh, it always struck me that, that all of the Wisconsin folks really were my tribe when, whenever I saw this, uh, this sculpture there and the um, in, in their in their presentations, and you know, reflecting on uh, on Bill's influence on uh, on the asthma and allergy community, it's really you know unparalleled. And he's even when I already when I started in the field, he was a long long standing giant in, uh, in in allergic mechanisms. So it's been a real honor and pleasure to. Um, get to know him a little bit over the last few years, write, a, write an editorial with him uh, last year, um, interact with him at, uh, at meetings, and now, you know, this, uh, have, getting the opportunity to do this lectureship has been uh, really, really an honor. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Nazar. Thank you, Lynn, for, um, for the invitation. So I am going to hopefully not fumble with this laser pointer too much as I get into my presentation. I'm actually going to turn it off. And um, We'll get to, get into a little bit of, get into my talk here, and this title is slightly uh, slightly different from what uh, what was circulated. This, uh, uh, but it, the the idea is the same. We'll we'll be talking about eosinophilic uh, diseases in in particularly pulmonary eosinophilic diseases, uh, a little bit of old history and and, and new frontiers. These are my disclosures. I'll let those. Uh, uh, stand there for a second, but uh, in particular, there's some uh, consulting and research support from uh, AstraZeneca and GlaxoSmithKline and um, re research support from Regeneron, and these are for, for clinical trials. These are our learning objectives for, uh, for the talk that uh, one will try to understand that ESNFLs are the target of uh, new asthma therapies or newer asthma therapies. We'll learn some, somewhat about the clinical spectrum of EGPA, um, a important eosinophilic disease characterized by asthma and systemic uh, manifestations. And then we'll also learn about other eosinophilic quote unquote asthma plus conditions. So eosinophilic diseases can affect every, every organ system. Um, but in particular, there's a, there's a predilection for, for, for the lungs. And there's a, a set of um, uh, pulmonary diseases here, uh, particularly severe eosinophilic asthma, ABPA, uh, and, and increasingly other things that weren't previously recognized like COPD, uh, and then other true eosinophilic diseases like eosinophilic pneumonia. But it's important to understand the concept that, you know, eosinophils are a somewhat unique cell in that they um, really are the only cell that I can, I can think of where there's this intersection between a set of conditions and a particular, particular cell type. And uh, that, that in, in particular has been fascinating to me and has driven a lot of my, my interest in, uh, in eosinophil biology. 
as a pulmonologist. And this particular picture uh, comes from a piece that just got published in the annual review of immunology about uh, eosinophilic uh, diseases in the era of eosinophil depleting therapies. And, I, and you'll see a little symbol here uh, on a couple of slides where there's Wisconsin folks involved. In this case, Samir Mathur is uh, author on this, uh, this publication that I'm a co-author on as well. And, you know, I put our sports, UCSD sports logo here on, um, on, the, uh, on the slide it, as, alongside the Wisconsin sports logo. I will say UCSD sports are not nearly as illustrious as, uh, as Wisconsin sports, um, but, uh, but I'll, I'll put it there, uh, you know, all the, all the same. And that, that symbol is the trident uh, or the triton. We are the UCSD tritons. Again, not a household name. So, you know, in, the, in that context of eosinophilic diseases um, and particularly eosinophilic diseases affecting the lungs, I, I like to look at the, the world of uh, eosinophilic pulmonary diseases on this, on this roadmap um, with eosinophilic asthma sitting in the center of that, of that roadmap. And we'll talk uh, to start about eosinophilic asthma and, and eosinophil depleting therapies in, in eosinophilic asthma. But then there are a set of, as I said in the learning objective slides, asthma plus conditions where it's asthma, but a little bit more, whether it be allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, where there's asthma plus uh, uh, hypersensitivity to um, uh, to aspergillus antigens. There's asthma that's, that's just more fungal uh, driven rather than, uh, rather than true ABPA. And then on the other side of the slide, there's diseases that are characterized by uh, eosinophilic infiltration of the lungs, but with also systemic manifestations, whether it be EGPA with multi-organ involvement, uh, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia with uh, single organ involvement, um, or uh, hyper eosinophilic syndromes where, where the lungs can be involved. And we'll touch on all of these things in our, in our brief, uh, brief tour. Um, so. so I like when I talk about, um, about asthma and particularly eosinophilic asthma to have a little bit of a historical perspective. Um, and that starts with uh, this, this slide. This is a, um, a slide from Archives of Internal Medicine from 1922. And this is a autopsy series from Huber and Kessler from the University of Chicago. And Huber and Kessler were, were pathologists. And um, in asthma, in, in 1922 in asthma, uh, asthma was, often a, or at least severe asthma, was a fatal disease. And this is before, uh, or sh only shortly after um, uh, adrenaline or epinephrine was biosynthesized or purified from animal sources and given uh, systemically, and there was no metered dose inhalers. There wasn't even um, uh, biosynthesis of uh, corticosteroids at, at that point. So Huber and Kessler, they did their autopsy series of patients who died from asthma, and they um, looked at some of their specimens of the lung under the microscope, and they didn't have fancy cameras like uh, attached to their microscopes like we do in our labs today. So they drew out their findings with colored pencils. And what they, what they draw here in their, in their uh, paper from 100 years ago is very similar to what you would see in a paper from 2021. They saw mucus plugs, they saw thick and smooth muscle in the airways, and importantly, they described eosinophils, eosinophilic infiltration, and this is some low power eosinophils, but here are some high power eosinophils in the, uh, um, in the airways. So eosinophils had been noted as being associated with severe asthma for 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 a hundred years, and even even you know prior to that even. So this observation had has had been a through line through twentieth century asthma research, and if you fast forward about seventy years here, there's this seminal paper that many of the you know asthma mavens on the call on the uh, Zoom will, will recognize from Jean Bosquet. This is from New England Journal in 1990. And 
uh, in this paper, the, these authors describe that eosinophilic um, uh, inflammation correlates with asthma severity. So these are airway biopsies stained for an eosinophilic granule protein. And you can see this brown staining on the slides uh, showing the presence of, uh, of eosinophils on these airway biopsies. And the uh, eosinophils seen correlated with the, with the severity score for, uh, for asthma. So again, this observation that there are eosinophils present uh, in the lung and uh, uh, they are there in, in severe asthma. But the question really remained over all of this time, these decades and almost a century of research, were the eosinophils are there, yes, but are they mechanistically important? Are they just bystanders in the uh, allergic process? Uh, that, uh, that is occurring in the airway, or do they really have an important role in, in uh, perpetuating disease, perpetuating the symptoms of, of asthma? And you know, around, um, the, around the turn of this century, um, this, this, uh, this question started to become more, uh, more in the fore as far as investigation. And one of the first indications, and I'm not giving the exact linear narrative here, but one of the first indications that, uh, that eosinophils were indeed important in asthma come from animal models. And this is for people in the eosinophil world. Again, there's, you know, because I'm speaking to the uh, University of Wisconsin uh, Department of Medicine, there are many people on this, uh, um, on this Zoom who know this, uh, these, these data better than I, but, uh, the, these two papers are, you know, are seminal papers in, in, in eosinophil biology and in asthma. Uh, these are two eosinophil deficient mouse models uh, that show a decrease in airway inflammation with, uh, with the lack of eosinophil. So these are the first two um, uh, papers. They appeared in the same issue of science back to back, two different mouse models of, um, uh, of eosinophil deficient uh, uh, mice. Uh, who and these mice uh, again both uh, both had decreased airway response and OVA sensitization and, and challenge models. So just to I won't belabor this too much for the interest of time, but uh, these are double GATA mice showed decreased airway inflammation here in the lower right panel, and these fill mice from uh, the late Jamie Lee's lab showed decreased uh, in this uh, this panel mucus production in the in the airways in response to um, an OVA. Uh, asthma challenge and uh, sensitization and challenge. So based on some of these observations um, the and some you know leaps of faith even before that uh, those science papers, there was a move to try to target eosinophils as, a, as an asthma therapeutic. And uh, that strategy was centered on blockade the blockade of a cytokine called IL5. And this cartoon from uh, is just shows an eosinophil with the IL-5 receptor embedded in the in the surface. And IL-5 is really um, uh, the key cytokine for eosinophil growth and uh, development from from myeloid precursors and survival after uh, after eosinophils are, are are developed from myeloid precursors. So. IL-5 blockade, either through blockade of the soluble cytokine itself with the monoclonal antibody or through blockade of the, of the receptor, um, is really uh, a strategy to eliminate eosinophil production and uh, decrease eosinophil survival. So this was pursued as a, as a strategy uh, bolstered by observations that eosinophil deficient animal models have improved uh, asthma readouts the anti-IL-5 blockade was pursued as a, uh, as a strategy. So a lot of excitement about this, but you know, this paper and, uh, and, uh, and some other data, including um, a paper that uh, Dr. Bussey and, and myself and Dr. George Rohr were talking about last night with some other folks, um, but uh, showed that um, actually took the, the wind out of the sail substantially for, for uh, anti-IL-5 blockade as a therapeutic strategy. So this paper, just when I was coming into eosinophil research um, that appeared in uh, the, the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, showed that mepolizumab at two different doses, and mepolizumab is that anti-L5 monoclonal antibody, did not have a clinical effect in unselected patients with asthma. So this for several years did, uh, you know, the narrative about uh, eosinophil 
depleting strategies was that they didn't work. And that's based largely on, on this paper. Uh, so this paper used uh, FEV1 or force expiratory volume in the first second as the as a clinical clinical readout, which had been the standard for, for asthma trials for um, a long time. But there's a few things to consider. Um, you know, is this was this paper really indicative of the truth of uh, the effectiveness of eosinophil blockade in asthma, or are there is there study design issues here that uh, that that needed to be considered? And so, in in examining these data in a, in a post hoc fashion, it became clear that there may be some signals here that were that were blunted by by study design. So there are particular particular issues to to think about. So the selection of patients, most importantly. The, the negative study from the previous slide was in all comers, um, rather than selecting patients who might have a particular type of asthma, who might be more eosinophilic. Um, there's also some thought that there perhaps was incomplete suppression of blood and tissue eosinophilia with the, uh, um, with the doses of mepolizumab chosen in that paper. And also in a post hoc fashion, um, investigators noted that there was a trend toward reduction in exacerbations with the, with the monoclonal antibody. And so meaning maybe spirometry or FEV1 is the wrong readout. Maybe there are other asthma domains that are the proper readout for uh, showing the effic efficacy of eosinophil depletion. So focusing on uh, number one and number three here, uh, you know, mepolizumab after being kind of uh, dropped to the mat, uh, picked itself up and, uh, you know, there was new trials designed. And this, uh, this paper uh, that appeared five years later was really um, a very important paper, not, in ju not just in demonstrating the efficacy of this particular agent, but in you know, reframing how we think about doing clinical trials in, in asthma. So, in this paper, that these uh, Ian Payward and, and colleagues from the UK, uh, they uh, showed that specifically targeting eosinophils in eosinophilic asthma improves outcomes. So they learned two lessons from the previous failed study that that one should select patients with uh, the proper uh, biomarkers. So in this case, patients were selected based on sputum eosinophilia uh, of greater than 3% on a, on a cytospin of, a, of eosinophil of, a, of a sputum from patients from, with asthma. And also the trial was designed around a primary readout or a primary outcome of exacerbations, total number of exacerbations. So you can see here that uh, when you change those two things in, in trial design, uh, there's a dramatic uh, difference in, in outcome from the trial. So the three doses of mepolizumab chosen showed decreased exacerbations over about a 50% decrease in exacerbations over placebo over a one year period of time. So this was a really important paper in, in many ways. And this eventually uh, led to the uh, there were several other studies after after this. I won't belabor them all. That uh, eventually led to the approval of um, of mepolizumab or eosinophil depleting anti IL five therapy for the treatment of asthma in um, in in 2015. And uh, there are other anti IL five agents that have similarly shown uh, nice uh, nice efficacy. All of the papers in this space show kind of show a 50% reduction in exacerbations. This is um, um, a paper from Mario Castro um, showing the efficacy of one of the other anti-L5 agents, resolizumab. The, the studies are the, the graphically just displayed a little bit different as, um, uh, as time to first clinically um, significant exacerbation rather than uh, cumulative exacerbations from the, from the previous paper. And then, um, and the, uh, and this uh, agent is the anti-L5 receptor agent, uh, also similarly showing efficacy in steroid dependent um, uh, folks with asthma, showing a decrease in steroid dose, and again, a decrease in exacerbations, again, about 50% reduction in exacerbations. So, and there's, again, in all, for all three of these agents, several other papers showing efficacy of the, of the drug and um, important papers. I just uh, um, didn't want to bore you with too many clinical trials in, in, in the same space. But uh, so these drugs are all 
uh, now approved for asthma, and they've really changed the way we, we treat asthma uh, in that we have new options for severe asthma. And we, it's also introduced this concept of um, endotypes of asthma or has been part of introducing uh, the concept of endotypes for asthma, that there are particular, um, particular flavors of asthma that have different mechanistic underpinnings and those mechanistic underpinnings may, you know, may influence therapy. So um, whether you know, some of us could quibble about whether eosinophilic asthma is a phenotype or an endotype, but, uh, but regardless, uh, defining the flavor of the asthma has now influenced how we, how we treat asthma rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. So with that, as, as I said, the eosinophil has become an important target in asthma, and, and we've, we've spoken about these anti-IL-5 agents, but there are other potential uh, therapeutic targets, including uh, this molecule, SIGLEC-8, that's on the surface of eosinophils, where uh, there's, a, uh, there's a, a newer monoclonal antibody that's in, um, in various stage studies for, for different eosinophilic diseases and uh, indications that are, that are uh, uh, had nice promising, promising data in several several realms. So um, I'll take a little bit of a diversion here away from, from eosinophils just to say, you know, we've, we've um, now defined a very important uh, phenotype or endotype of, of asthma. But the fly in the ointment is that asthma is a heterogeneous disease. So we've done, there's been a lot of great stuff that's happened in what's so-called T2 high or TH2 high asthma, very uh, allergic driven asthma. These are the patients with more eosinophilia, but there's also uh, patients, you know, and again, people, there's controversy about how, what percentage of patients with asthma are actually uh, people who have who are quote T2 low or TH2 low. Uh, and these are really people who don't have these allergic markers. And then uh, unfortunately, some of our therapeutic options for them are, are a little bit, um, you know, uh, we, have little, we have fewer therapeutic options for these patients with T2 asthma that are uh, specific to the, this, uh, this phenotype or, or endotype. And, uh, you know, Dr. Bussey and, and I, wrote an editorial last year about, uh, about differences in, 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 the, in the importance of um, uh, different factors in, in influencing asthma heterogeneity. This was an editorial on an article that appeared about sex and age um, influencing asthma heterogeneity. And I just introduced this here in honor of the Bussey uh, uh, lectureship and also just to um, emphasize that there are many domains of heterogeneity and, and asthma that, uh, that influence our um, our uh, therapies and our and, and the response to therapies. So back to you know again another tangent, but that's uh, somewhat related to to eosinophils. So now um, we use blood eosinophils rather than sputum eosinophils as a biomarker for defining uh, response to to anti eosinophil therapies in in asthma, but. Can we do better than that? Blood eosinophil count is probably an inadequate biomarker. You know, using a single cut point for defining whether some a patient is responsive or unresponsive to a to a medication is, you know, fairly fairly inadequate. And I think as an eosinophil biology person, it's also a little bit. Uh, it hurts a little to have the complexity of a cell like the eosinophil reduced to a single single count. But that's what's happened in clinical practice. That. Uh, that uh, eosinophil count of 300 or greater is often considered a, a patient who will respond to these uh, biologic therapies while a count of less than 300 will be a non-responder. But if you comb through the data of some of these clinical trials in this space, it's apparent there's non-responders who live on the higher side of the cut point and there's responders to therapy who live on the, on the lower side of the, of the frontier. So we can almost certainly do better. So uh, again, as, a, as an aside, this is where efforts like the precise network that Dr. Jarjor had mentioned at the, at the, in the introduction to the talk that the, uh, that the, that the team and your um, institution led by Lauren Denlinger and uh, involving Dr. Jarjor as well, and uh, many others, including uh, Dan Jackson in pediatrics, uh, and some other centers, including our center, uh, are involved in. And this precise network is an adaptive platform trial uh, measuring uh, or, or 
testing multiple interventions with refinement of biomarkers over the course of the trial. So perhaps over time, we'll be able to do better about defining biomarkers and, and having a multi-biomarker strategy or understanding in a trial where the best cut point is based on adaptive approaches. So that's, again, a, a ESN, a, a, an aside for, uh, from, from eosinophils. So let's go back to our asthma eosinophil roadmap. And uh, I want to slide over to the, to the right here to uh, diseases that involve not just um, not just asthma, but systemic manifestations as well. And we'll, we'll start with, um, with, with EGPA. And, uh, and that's eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So we'll start with the historic perspective there. And you, know, you may know EGPA as the Church-Strauss syndrome. That's what it's uh, been known as for, for many years. And this paper is from the American Journal of Pathology from 1951, and this is the original uh, paper from Churg and Strauss from Mount Sinai Hospital. Again, this is an autopsy series describing this, uh, this syndrome. So Churg and Strauss uh, noted a series of patients that came to their, you know, to their autopsy room uh, who had a history of severe asthma for, for several years going into their you know, ultimate demise as along with the history of rhinosinusitis, so lower and upper airways disease. And these patients all had hyper eosinophilia and they also had pneumonia. Uh, and I mean, and they meant that not in the infectious sense, but in the infiltrative sense, but they also noticed on, um, on their autopsy specimens or their microscopic specimens that these patients had eosinophilic arteritis and granulomas. So they had eosinophilic vasculitis. So they uh, termed this, uh, or others termed this syndrome, the Church-Strauss syndrome, and really it was known for, for many years as, a, as an eosinophilic vasculitis. But um, I think as over the, over the decades, what's been refined is that, uh, you know, what Churg and Strauss described was really the end manifestation of a, um, of a disease that had been progressing for a long, long period of time. So at the end, uh, at, at the time of death, there was a, a substantial vasculitis. But I think it's become clear over the years that, that EGPA, what it is, kind of depends on your, your perspective. Um, so EGPA for a pulmonologist is a severe asthma variant. Um, for a eosinophilic diseases person, um, I wear two of those hats and it's a, it's a eosinophilic disease. And for a rheumatologist, uh, it's a uh, subset of the ANCA positive vasculitity. So it really depends on your perspective, what this disease is and what kind of flavor of, uh, of EGPA that you see in your practice is influenced by whether you're a pulmonologist or allergist, where you might see somebody has more of an asthma manifestation versus uh, a rheumatologist who may see more systemic vasculitic manifestations. So I like to show this uh, this uh, these uh, optometrist instruments is it number one or number two? It really just depends on your your perspective. So, EGPA again is um, a systemic disease, and it doesn't involve just the lungs, but multiple multiple organ systems. And in particular, uh, the upper airway sinonasal disease is an important manifestation of of this disease. Um, but there can be other uh, more um, more vasculitic or manifestations that are more like other ANCA positive vasculitities, uh, renal disease with an active sediment, gastrointestinal disease, um, neurologic disease, and not just brain, but peripheral uh, neurologic disease with uh, modern neuritis multiplex and other uh, peripheral neuropathies. So from a diagnostic perspective, EGPA, uh, there's been you know, years of back and forth about what uh, uh, what EGPA is or how to define EGPA. But I would emphasize, um, you know, for those of you who may see patients like this, um, that EGPA really is a syndromic diagnosis and doesn't require a biopsy like uh, or a or or a microscopic specimen like was seen with uh, with with Churg and Strauss in 1951. 
but the diagnosis of EGPA depends on having asthma and often a history of escalating and severe asthma along with hyper eosinophilia along with two features in the right hand column and yes that can be a biopsy but it can be a, a pick list of other organ manifestations including uh, neuropathy uh, pulmonary infiltrates uh, sinonasal disease and then other organ manifestations as well and, and you'll, you'll notice here at the end uh, that patients may have a positive ANCA, uh, often the, the, the MPO um, uh, specific antibody, but they don't necessarily have to have a positive ANCA. So what was known as the Church-Strauss syndrome changed its name to EGPA, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis in uh, just a few years ago in the context of the Chapel Hill Consensus Conference from, uh, from the rheumatology uh, community where EGPA was lumped in with, uh, with the ANCA-associated small vessel vasculitides. But I wanna emphasize, even though if you open up a textbook, if you open up you know, Harrison's or, or whatever else, and EGPA is called an ANCA positive uh, small vessel vasculitis. I want to emphasize that it is a sometimes ANCA positive uh, condition and is sometimes a vasculitis. It's really a syndromic uh, diagnosis, which can eventually get to ANCA positivity and vasculitis, but not necessarily. Just want to uh, give you a quick tour of what uh, EGPA might look like under the microscope, because again, it's not necessarily what you would expect this based on the textbook of, uh, of seeing only um, vasculitis. You can, if you do a lung biopsy, just see infiltration of eosinophils into the uh, air spaces or infiltration of eosinophils. In this case, this is a cardiac biopsy uh, showing eosinophils infiltrating between um, um, uh, cardiac myocytes. And yes, you can see a frank vasculitis as well. This is a uh, micrograph of, uh, of a frank, uh, frank vasculitis. So back to this question, you know, is EGPA severe asthma variant an eosinophilic disease or a vasculitis or how often is it any of these things? I think our best data come from uh, a large case study series that came out um, a few years ago from the French vasculitis study group. These are about a, a 50 year um, follow-up of patients with uh, EGPA or Church-Strauss syndrome in, um, in France. And um, so a couple of things jump out there that uh, help you know, differentiate the flavors of this, uh, this condition. About 31% of the patients were ANCA positive in this disease. So that's the best number that I would quote for ANCA positivity in EGPA. And then these patients are slightly more likely to have things that might, one might consider more vasculitic like renal and neurologic manifestations, but they also have more ENT manifestations as well. So EGPA treatment uh, historically has been, um, uh, you know, difficult. There, we've, we've depended largely on, on corticosteroids with some other, you know, agents for um, uh, steroid sparing um, or agents um, for that cytotoxic agents for induction of, uh, of remission in, in patients who have particular uh, system, systemic and uh, vasculitic manifestations, including cyclophosphamide and, and rituximab. But uh, but really, uh, a lot of these patients, once they're on maintenance therapy, have got historically been stuck on steroids with all of the uh, uh, side effects that uh, chronic steroid therapy um, confer. So, you know, back to what we were talking about with asthma, how about, uh, you know, the question about how about targeting eosinophils directly with IL anti-IL-5 agents, would that be an effective, uh, effective strategy and potentially be steroid sparing in these, age, in these patients and, and substantially improve quality of, quality of life? So in this uh, paper that I participated in with some other, you know, some other folks, um, we uh, indeed uh, were able to show the, the efficacy of mepolizumab for, for EGPA. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll skip, uh, skip this slide because it's a little busy, but uh, um, I'll show you this slide showing that with, uh, with mepolizumab, there's a uh, greater number of participants in remission for their EGPA versus placebo. And um, 
a smaller number of relapses over the one year period of time compared to compared to placebo. So again, about a 50% reduction in relapse looks very similar to, to asthma data. And, uh, you know, based on those data, the FDA approved EG, uh, mepolizumab for, uh, for EGPA in, in 2017. And this has been one of those, you know, for the, for the residents who are, who are listening in, this has been one of those fun things about doing research that, uh, you know, and you may think of EGPA as a rare disease. It is pretty rare, but you know, when you're in an academic center, you, you do see these. And you know, with my practice, I, I, I've seen quite a few of these patients over the years. I you know, have a, a panel of them. Um, you know, I'd seen how much particularly the uh, chronic long-term steroids had um, affected their quality of life. And then you know, participating in a study and then being able to see that come to fruition and then uh, treating my patients with the, with the drug and seeing it improve their quality of, of life and able to have a lot of them get off of uh, chronic steroids. It's been really a, um, a gratifying thing. And I think uh, one of those, you know, advertisements for being in academic medicine and doing, uh, doing investigation. So I think I'll always, you know, point to this experience as um, something, uh, something formative in my, in my career. So we've also done some uh, post-hoc analyses of these data um, showing that uh, if you use more of a real world definition for remission, a 50% reduction in glucocorticoid dose um, uh, as, a, as a remission criteria, uh, in addition to you know, more stringent criteria like this Birmingham vasculitis activity score uh, being zero, um, if you kind of lump the, that, that clinical benefit definition, you see a nice um, cumulative um, improvement with mepolizumab compared to, compared to placebo uh, as far as having a clinical benefit from the, from the medication. So there are other anti-IL-5 agents in EGPA that are being, um, you know, that, that are um, either been shown in case series to, to have potentially have some um, efficacy or are being uh, tested in, in, a, in randomized clinical trials. So um, in particular, this, this agent benralizumab is currently in a phase three uh, trial against, um, uh, against mepolizumab head to head. To head. Um, and I can't remember whether you're recruiting for that in, um, in Madison or not, but uh, it's um, a trial that's uh, you know, a, a global, global trial and hopefully we'll have some results in a year and a half or so. So I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent from clinical considerations just to, you know, uh, sprinkle a little bit of, of, um, of basic or translational eosinophil immunology into their, um, into the talk. But is there, is there more to eosinophils than, than IL-5? And uh, IL-5, as I mentioned, is really, um, you know, considered the, the key cytokine for, for multiple eosinophil uh, development um, pathways and for uh, survival and trafficking pathways. So, uh, you know, IL-5 is important for differentiation and proliferation, but there are other, uh, there are two other cytokines, GMCSF and IL-3, that have very similar effects on eosinophils, including trafficking, survival, activation, and, uh, and degranulation. And that's because IL-5 signals through um, a common uh, beta chain on its receptor uh, that's common to GMCSF and, and IL-3. So uh, it kind of begs the question, when you, when you target IL-5, are you really uh, uh, targeting everything there is about uh, you know, eosinophilic inflammation in the, in the airways or in, in, in other organs? So, um, you know, my, my lab thought about this a little bit and, and did a um, transcriptomic study of, uh, IL of IL-3 and IL-5 and GMCSF to look at the differential transcriptomic signatures in these, um, uh, with, with these um, uh, cytokine stimulation of ex, ex vivo human eosinophils. And this paper was uh, uh, done by uh, Ryan Nelson, who was in my lab and is now in uh, in, in practice in, in Bend, Bend, Oregon, uh, seeing sometimes patients with eosinophilic diseases. But um, uh, what Ryan found is that on this principal component analysis, uh, which defines you know, how different the signatures are from uh, in, a, in a data set, that the IL-3 did seem to have a distinct signature compared to the other, um, other two uh, cytokines that signal to that common beta chain. And we did some work um, to kind of define what the um, 
what the differential gene expression of from IL three was, and this, and we got went at this with two different methods, kind of traditional differential gene expression, which is what is up up in this corner here, uh, panel A, and something called a weighted gene co-expression network analysis, where you uh, you you look for um, you look for networks of upregulated genes, kind of agnostic of um, of uh, what the what the potential stimulation was, but what we found was one of the uh, networks that we found, one of the modules that we found, was highly overlapping with uh, with with IL three upregulations. It's kind of a belt and suspenders approach to show that this group of genes is indeed um, IL three associated, and there are particular hub genes that uh, that uh, define the network most most strongly. Um, and I, uh, for those of you who like old television, I always thought this uh, this plot looks like cousin it from the Adams family. Um, so, and there are you know particular hub genes that we that we showed in this paper, and and this just uh, is a demonstration of how you can then take these take these uh, you know targets that you find from a transcriptomic study, and then bring them back to the lab and do more mechanistic work. And in particular, right now we're doing work on this. Uh, uh, this protein QSOX1, which is a disulfide bond linker. Um, so that's, uh, you know, kind of how you can take some transcriptomic work and potentially translate it and hopefully translate it to, into clinical, clinical work as well. And one of the reasons I brought up IL-3 in particular is that this has been an uh, interest of uh, folks here in the Department of Medicine, including uh, Stefan here, who published this paper with Dean Mosier and with Dr. Jarjora as well, um, showing uh, eosinophil IL-3 related proteomics. This is a volcano plot showing uh, particular gene targets that are particular uh, protein um, uh, products that are upregulated with, with IL-3 and, and human eosinophil. So, um, you know, kind of a, if you overlay some data from, from Stefan's paper with, uh, with our paper, you start to get a picture of um, kind of differential biology from, differ from differential um, uh, stimulation of, um, of of human eosinophils. So, okay, so that was a brief uh, brief mechanistic slash uh, immunologic aside. So we'll go back to the eosinophil asthma roadmap, and I want to slide um, back to the other side here, to the more uh, asthma plus conditions uh, that are not necessarily. Um, characterized by systemic manifestations, and that in, in particular is, is, is ABPA, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, again, like EGPA, kind of if you see enough asthma patients, you're going to see all of these things with, with even though they're considered rare entities, you'll see them with fair regularity. So ABPA is a uh, type of asthma where there is in particular a very revved up response to aspergillus antigens in the airway. So a very uh, hyper allergic response. And this is a, uh, a, a typical, but not obligatory CT scan of what, uh, what imaging an ABPA might look like. And here you can see um, there are uh, dilated airways um, uh, particularly central airway. So this is the classic central bronchiectasis and you can see some, uh, some infiltrates, peripherally nodular infiltrates, some uh, indication that there might be some mucus plugging causing some of these peripheral uh, infiltrates. So ABPA does require a predisposing diagnosis of asthma or cystic fibrosis. So uh, patients can have air, uh, cystic fibrosis as their predisposing airways disease leading to, leading to ABPA. And then there are other obligatory criteria for ABPA, including uh, showing aspergillus skin test positivity um, or a specific serum IgE. So this is showing that your patient has a specific uh, IgE mediated response to aspergillus antigens. And then these patients also have very high uh, total IgE levels as well. And then they can meet that diagnosis with other, uh, other criteria, two of these three, either the 
classic imaging findings, um, the so-called aspergillus serum precipitins, which is really just an IgG against uh, or showing that there's an IgG response to aspergillus antigens, and then the elevated eosinophil count. So uh, ABPA is indeed an eosinophilic disease, maybe not a hyper eosinophilic disease, but it is an eosinophilic disease. So you'll often see counts in the up to 1,000 1, of absolute eosinophils or even, even higher. You know, and there is probably something unique about aspergillus antigens that uh, that that drives the uh, drives conditions like like ABPA. And this this study, um, which I won't go through every every panel, but I will, you know, just uh, maybe point out this upper right panel is uh, is ex vivo stimulation of um, uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells um, with uh, various various um, stimuli and aspergillus antigens in particular in this uh, uh, in this context do seem to hyperproduce uh, so-called Th2 high cytokines in, in the upper right panel IL5 uh, and then this panel IL13. So with ABPA, we have some, because this is an, uh, even though it's not an infection per se, we do have some additional therapeutic options uh, that involve, you know, reducing the, the fungal burden in the airways. And that, that's um, the use of uh, azoles. And uh, there's not great data for it, but there is one randomized trial from 20 years ago showing uh, improvement in a uh, an overall response with itraconazole compared to placebo. Um, and again, you can, in a different paper from a few years later, you can see a reduction in eosinophil count with itraconazole versus placebo. So I do give my patients with AG, ABPA azoles, but now uh, because of safety profile, often um, voriconazole or posiconazole, um, or even sometimes uh, isofuconazole. So uh, these are a mainstay of therapy in ABPA. Um, biologics are also being uh, increasingly used in, in ABPA, kind of on a case report series. Omalizumab or anti-IgE therapy um, have been uh, successfully deployed. There are case reports of uh, benralizumab or anti-IL-5 receptor uh, blockade being effective. And there's also a phase three study for dupilumab, which is an IL-4, IL-13, blocker, which is a, another component of allergic inflammation of th, TH2 high inflammation. And that phase three trial is, is underway as well. So back to the roadmap, we'll go rapid hits for some of the last few uh, entities here to, to wrap up. But um, we'll, we'll talk again about now back to a systemic disease with, uh, with one organ or lung manifestations, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, these patients have a subacute progression of respiratory symptoms, but, uh, and, but they also have a high grade peripheral and BAL or bronchoalveolar lavage eosinophilia. And I've found uh, that many of these patients have overlap with eGPA. And in many ways, I think of these patients as single organ eGPA, where I still just haven't found the other, uh, other organ manifestation, or maybe the other shoe hasn't dropped because of uh, chronic steroid, uh, steroid use. And these patients also often get stuck on, on steroids, just like eGPA patients. This is a uh, picture of a patient of mine um, from a few years ago. Um, uh, showing the classic peripheral infiltrates that one sees in, in chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, uh, you could see the, the, the peripheral infiltrates on the CT scan as well. If I had a little bit more time, I would show you again another historic um, uh, paper, the initial description of chronic eosinophilic pneumonia from Carrington et al. from the 1960s from New England Journal. But that's where this description that you see in textbooks of uh, photo negative of CHF or peripheral infiltrates being the classic uh, classic uh, imaging finding for, for chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. It's important to note that the, it, the imaging can be like this, but doesn't necessarily have to be like this. The infiltrates don't have to have this classic peripheral peripheral pattern, but, uh, but the Carrington's disease or uh, the Carrington's disease description from the 1960s really uh, had a lot of weight, even in how we think about the classic manifestations uh, today. So 
Acute eosinophilic pneumonia, which is not on my asthma eosinophilic roadmap, is a it's kind of a, the other the cousin of a chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. And these, an acute eosinophilic pneumonia is a condition of more, uh, as the name implies, acute respiratory failure. So these are patients who end up in the ICU. They look all the world like they have ARDS, but you do the bronchoscopy in them, and they have a high grade uh, eosinophilia in their in their BAL specimen. And these patients respond quickly and exquisitely to steroids and uh, are able to get off the ventilator quickly. And there are some associations, including smoking or escalation of smoking uh, associated with acute eosinophilic pneumonia, as well as some other things that have been described in the literature, like uh, Gulf War soldiers who also had a higher rate, had a higher rate of smoking and World Trade Center firefighters. But most of these cases are, are idiopathic. Um, I saw this patient a few years ago who uh, was a 21-year-old uh, uh, nanny au pair who had started to um, smoke uh, over the previous month uh, in an escalating amount and came in with respiratory failure with this, uh, this uh, CT scan, coronal view and this x-ray, and she was intubated and um, uh, very hypoxemic, but uh, had 90% BAL eosinophils, and uh, we started steroids, and she was off the vent um, 48 hours later. So finally, I want to talk um, about, I won't talk extensively about hyper eosinophilic syndromes, but I just want to wrap up a little bit of what's out there for eosinophil depleting therapies for eosinophilic diseases. So anti-IL-5 therapy also is being deployed in, in, in hyper eosinophilic syndromes. And this has been you know, a, a specialty of, of folks here in Madison, including Samir Mothor. And uh, um, hyper eosinophilic syndrome actually had a positive paper a, long, uh, a while back, a dozen years ago, um, showing steroid sparing for, for um, hyper eosinophilic syndrome patients. But uh, this drug was not approved for, for hyper eosinophilic syndrome, uh, kind of a good lesson in how to design trials because there was no clinically reported outcome in this, in this study. It was really a study that um, re its main readout was a uh, daily dose of, of prednisone rather than what the FDA considered a clinically relevant readout. So there was a newer paper now just uh, actually 2020, not 2021, uh, that was published with more clinically relevant endpoints, um, including uh, HES flares showing mepolizumab or anti-L5 therapy showing an effect compared to placebo. So now uh, the medication is now approved for hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So, um, so now in the eosinophilic diseases world, this has been great because we have uh, therapies that have been approved for eosinophilic diseases while for, for a long time we had no, no specific therapies other than, than steroids. So what I left out of this talk was um, was infection. And, uh, you know, for those of you in, in the infectious disease division, you know, there are a series of, uh, of mostly parasitic conditions that cause um, uh, eosinophilic uh, pulmonary infiltration. And that's a whole other one hour talk, but uh, I'll, I'll refer you to this paper from myself and Peter Weller from 10 years ago that, uh, that, that has a nice uh, summary of some of these uh, some of these conditions. So that is all that I have. I think I am on time, um, and uh, you know we are in an era of new horizons in eosinophilic diseases. And um, and I would like to acknowledge my lab, um, particularly since I showed some of my data there. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge you know, the, my colleagues in the Precise Network, particularly uh, my colleagues here in, in Madison in the, in the Precise Network. So uh, with that, uh, hopefully there's time for a question or two. Great, well, thank you, Praveen. That was really a, a wonderful overview of eosinophil biology and where we are today and really a fitting tribute to the legacy of Dr. Busty um, and um, really appreciate it. Uh, we are almost at the end. I will ask one question that has been vexing me. Do you have uh, a hint or a, a process by which you remember which antibody is targeting which receptor? Um, as more and more antibodies come out, the generic names I find very confusing. So is there a rhyme or reason to that? <laughs> there, there is not much rhyme or reason. Um, you know, and Lynn, I'll say it as an aside, this is a, 
you know, this is a tricky space because you know the the, the commercial interest in it too, and the and and um, you know there's a lot of, there's a lot of commercials out there for some of these uh, for some of these agents as as well. I try to be careful to you know stick with the stick with the generic names, but it's hard to you know with patients because uh, they they get the commercials stuck in their head and uh, uh, they use the the trade names, but. Right. Um, but unfortunately, there's not uh, there's not rhyme or reason, and uh, best I can say is uh, uh, you know sometimes maybe I write it on the back of my hand and uh, <laughs> it, it just uh, refer refer to that. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we are out of time. I really want to thank you for uh, an outstanding presentation, uh, and we look forward to continuing collaborating with uh, you moving forward. Great, thank you. Thank you all. Take care.